Hello, everyone, and welcome to William Morancy, the show hosted by William Morancy. There's this band called Nickelback, one of the best-selling rock bands of all time, and formerly the most hated rock band of all time. Now that Nickelback is seeing some sort of critical reevaluation, I thought I'd try and share my experience listening to all of their albums front to back. I will be talking about their 10 studio albums. I won't be discussing the Hesher EP, any of Chad's solo material. I'm also not talking about their Elton John cover of Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. <laughs> okay, but what, what the hell is that? All of their studio albums, though, are fair game. So without further ado, here is my experience with Nickelback. Comes the next contestant. We were that close to not having to hear Nickelback ever on the radio? <laughs> Damn it. So Curb is their debut album. It came out in 1996, the year I was born. I am just as old as the Nickelback debut. Wow. Like other debut albums from underground rock bands in the 80s and 90s, it's rough around the edges. It wears its influences on its sleeves and has flashes of the formula they'd perfect down the road. The musicianship is solid, though a bit loose. There are definitely a few tracks where the tempo fluctuates maybe a bit. The guitar and bass are top-notch as they are on pretty much every Nickelback album. But the drums are a little bit more of a weak link on this album. The production is surprisingly lo-fi for a Nickelback album. There's usually a bit more of a budget that you can hear behind them. I remember I really didn't like the snare sound or the drum sound listening to it initially, but eventually it did sort of win me over because I realized that it wasn't really overpowering the mix all that much. And I also really didn't like Chad's vocals on first listen. After reading the lyrics of this album that are really, you know, emotionally potent, I mean, I still don't really like his vocals on here, but they make a little bit more sense. There are a few songs that are more just standard breakup songs like where and I don't have. But there are also some songs that delve into some really dark subject matter that Nickelback doesn't really explore as much down the road. Fly, which is the most popular song from this album, is about having an abusive alcoholic father. Left sounds like it's about watching your close friend slowly die and you're almost feeling complicit in their demise. And the opening track, Little Friend, is really kind of hard to listen to, because it sounds like it's about, like, child abduction. These lyrics are messed up, though the song that hit me the hardest was Window Shopper. I think it's told from the perspective of a victim of SA and their frustration at people who know about what's going on and are just kind of turning a blind eye to it. And a lot of the subject matter and just raw emotion pairs very well with all the grunge albums and grunge bands of the 90s. The track Left has kind of an Alice in Chains vibe. Songs like Fly and Just Force sound like Chad Kruger basically nailed Kurt Cobain's songwriting style to a T. And Seagroove and Pusher sound a bit like Pearl Jam. Overall, it's a solid debut, and it shows hints of the world-conquering rock bands they'd become. My favorite tracks on the album are Seagroove, Fly, Window Shopper, and Left. Here comes the next contestant! Hey now, is this really a World War II reference? Their second album is called The State. It dropped initially in 1998, but I have one really big issue with this album. It should be called The Province. I mean, these guys are clearly Canadian. Anyways, this album is really good. The gap in quality between their first two albums is about as wide as the gap between Radiohead's first two albums in quality. And it's an interesting parallel because Pablo Honey and Curb are both fairly generic 90s alt-rock albums with occasional flashes of brilliance hinting toward their future successes. I don't want to hate too much on the drummer on Curb because 
I think he fit those songs well, but the drumming here is insane. The drumming on the closing track, Hold Out Your Hand, is excellent and shows much more technical ability than most of their other post-grunge comrades. The polyrhythms between the drums and guitar on one last run, and the 6-4 verses of Diggin' This are actually quite interesting and hint towards the higher level of musicianship and rhythmic chemistry they display on future albums. The production has definitely gone up a level on this album. The drums, guitar, and bass all sound a lot less compressed and... The overall atmosphere is much warmer. The sound palette this time around is also a little more varied. The way that the acoustic guitars and additional instruments are panned in the mix is really, really wonderful. The vocals are also much more dynamic. Chad's softer vocals contrast really nicely with his more growly vocals. And he has better control of his voice here than on Curb. And there's also more effects on Chad's vocals here. They do add some nice variety. There's also more variety in the topics discussed in the lyrics. Lead single, Leader of Men, is a song Chad wrote while under the influence of Magic Mushrooms. And it is about magic mushrooms. The lyrics don't explicitly reference drugs, but after hearing that it's about them, it gives context to the idea of the lyrics about things being hard to swallow and just the whole idea of following where the drugs take you. Worthy to Say also is about drugs and it's about like Chad and his friends doing drugs and potentially getting busted by the cops. And sonically, the trip-hop drums and psychedelic guitar riffs add to the sort of druggy atmosphere of the song. And while Worthy to Say implies some sort of naivete on Chad's part, One Last Run is about Chad dealing drugs and being on the run from the cops. <laughs> There are also some other songs that are just sort of about jealousy of, you know, other people and men around you. Like the song Breathe is a good example of that. And it's apparently in reference to a tense conversation between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Nickelback writing a song about World War II is... It's interesting. Then we have more emotionally impactful songs like there were on Curb. Cowboy Hat is about someone's father's issues with women and the impacts that they have on, you know, the protagonist's current relationships with women. Not Leaving Yet is about the passing of Chad's grandmother with biblical imagery and lyrics about how it really wasn't her time to go. And the emotional impact of the album goes up another level on the closing track that I mentioned earlier, Hold Out Your Hand, which is about World War II also. This album is bookended by two tracks referencing World War II. This one is about the Holocaust. It has the lyric, hard work will set you free, which is the English translation of the texts on the signs above concentration camps. There's references to children with stars on their chests, a reference to the badge that Jews had to wear for identification. Like th these are the guys who made look at this photograph or I like your pants around your feet. To know that they were ever making songs like this is very interesting. But overall, this whole album is a big step up from their debut and a top-notch post-grunge album and a breath of fresh air and a sea of new metal, Europop, and boy bands. It is a respectable sophomore album. Some of my favorite tracks include Breathe, Cowboy Hat, Leader of Men, Worthy to Say, One Last Run, and Hold Out Your Hand. Here comes the next contestant! This is how you remind me. So Silver Side Up is their third album, and it dropped on 9-11. In before someone types in the comments that this was the second worst thing to happen that day. So if Curve was Nickelback's Pablo Honey, and the state was their The Benz, that means that Silver Side Up is their OK Computer. An era-defining album, a futuristic take on rock music, and one of, if not the most critically acclaimed rock albums of all time. And Silver Side Up, I mean, it's an era-defining album. Not sure about those other two. This is the first album where you could put it on 
and someone would immediately recognize, oh yeah, this is this is that Nickelback band. Now, don't get me wrong. If Nickelback stopped dropping albums after this album, I doubt they'd be as hated as they were towards the end of the 2000s. I mean, production-wise, this album is more slick than The State. The drums definitely hit a bit harder. The guitars and cymbal crashes are just this auditory behemoth. Everything is firing on all cylinders. Though this album as a whole is not really them going into a much heavier direction than they've gone in the past. Now I'm not gonna give too much background info on any of these albums and the recording process, but the insane success of How You Remind Me is arguably the most pivotal moment in Nickelback's career. Songwriting-wise, it follows a pretty standard verse, chorus, verse structure. Chad's vocals in the verse are slightly softer and in his lower middle register. And then his vocals go up in intensity and range during the chorus. And there are hits during the chorus, during the I've been wrong, I've been down. The song structure here is like perfectly crafted. Maybe too perfectly, but it's definitely the best song that they've made in this style. And while it's not incredible, I see why it was as popular as it was. There's a few other songs on this album that basically try to sound like How You Remind Me, with a few differences in song structure here and there. Maybe less dynamic range between the verses and the choruses. Maybe vocals that vary a little bit less in range and delivery throughout. And maybe like a few songs that are softer or louder overall. Examples of this include Woke Up This Morning, Where Do I Hide, and Hangnail. There are a few head scratcher moments on this album. The odd drum mixes and weird background noises on Bunny Bot with like the trip hop drums make for a strange listen. Even on How You Remind Me, like the last two choruses, Chad hits an E natural over this C minor progression, which not to get all music theory or anything, but that catches me off guard every time I hear the song, and I've heard it a lot. I was alive in the 2000s. And while How You Remind Me marked a step forward in Nickelback's songwriting style, compositionally, this album reminds me a bit more of Curb than The State. Right down to the re-recording of Just Four from Curb. The vocals are more controlled, yet a bit less impactful. Chad's singing throughout this album and the rest of their discography is usually in the same Yarly delivery. There are also no like faster cuts on the album like on their last two albums and there aren't really any like pure ballads either. The one track that adds something new to the Nickelback formula is the closing track, Good Times Gone. It's a country rock track. The track genuinely sounds like the band trying something new and enjoying themselves in the process. Chad's voice works for their more metal influenced tracks but it arguably works even better in a country context, which might be why some people have issues with Nickelback when they say they listen to everything except rap and country. I think Nickelback is involved in there somewhere. The fuzzy slide guitars and finger-picked acoustic guitars sound really good in the jam session at the end of the song. It literally just sounds like the band having fun, and I'm having fun listening to it. And in the midst of this more middle-of-the-road Nickelback album, they actually managed to keep some emotional intensity in the lyrics. Never Again and Just For deal with themes of physical abuse. Too Bad is about a dad walking out on his family. Hangnail is about one of Chad's high school friends being heavily addicted to drugs. And Hollywood is about a drug overdose. Woke Up This Morning is the second song that Chad has written about his grandma passing. Overall, it is a step up in budget, but a slight step down in quality from the state, and it has less of the emotional impact of Curb. My favorite tracks on the album are Never Again, How You Remind Me, Too Bad, Where Do I Eyes, and uh, Good Times Gone. Here comes the next contestant. It's a slam dunk. So this is their fourth album that we're talking about, The Long Road. Some bands will follow up their commercial breakthrough with an album that kind of expands their sound much further to varying degrees of success. This album definitely expands their sound a little bit. It does feature some ideas that didn't show up on previous Nickelback albums, 
But there's one big influence on this album, and that is How You Remind Me. Lead single, Someday, sounds like How You Remind Me, but slower and less emotive. The lyrics and delivery seem way less personal this time around. He sounds like he's just making a breakup song as opposed to a song about a breakup he actually experienced. Do This Anymore is like halfway between How You Remind Me and Boulevard of Broken Dreams by Green Day, and it falls short of both of them. It is interesting to note that this song came out before Boulevard of Broken Dreams. While I would like to give Nickelback credit for that, I don't really like Boulevard of Broken Dreams all that much either. Should Have Listened is also kind of like how you remind me, but it's at least a little bit better. And the more acoustic approach to the how you remind me formula is kind of cool. Though the best How You Remind Me influence track is definitely feeling way too damn good. The chord progression here kind of reminds me of Dear Prudence by the Beatles, and actually is kind of trippy and psychedelic. And the transition from the verses to the choruses with all the feedback and stuff, it's definitely Nickelback's happiest song to date. And I really enjoy it. I thought this album was one of their worst when I listened to it in full last year. And upon re-listening, I actually think it's a step up from Silver Side Up overall. There may be more ballads here, but the heavier tracks actually go way harder. Flat on the Floor is a fast and balls-to-the-wall metal track. And Because of You is an absolute barn burner. The main riff may be kind of simple, but it goes insanely hard. It's kind of juxtaposed with, like these like dancey drums, it, it's actually, it's really interesting. But the bridge is absolutely ferocious. Guitar solos are great, and Chad's screams during this song are incredible. I almost feel like I'm being trolled with how good the bridges on their heavier songs are. I call them nickel bridges. Believe it or not is a weird track that is a little funky at certain points, and kind of works. This is the first album where Nickelback start to follow a formula for their track lists. The first track on this album, Heavy Track. Third track is the obvious radio single, which is usually a little softer and more melodic. Sometimes for the rest of the album, you'll have like two ballads or two heavier, edgier tracks back to back. And the closing tracks since Silver Side Up are usually the country-ish acoustic tracks about, you know, remembering the good times and all that. Man, back in my day. See You at the Show is the closing track on this album. This is like the original rock star. Another development on this album is that the penultimate track is more of an up-tempo power pop tune. And the track for this album, Another Hole in the Head, is a definite highlight. Now, the lyrics overall on this album have taken a bit of a hit. Instrumentally, the track Figured You Out is kind of generic, though admittedly I like the bridge, but the lyrics are pretty repulsive. It's the first song Nickelback has made about sex where they sound genuinely horny. I don't want my Nickelback too horny. Though there is one song lyrically that I think is one of their best, and that is Throw Yourself Away. It's about Melissa Drexler, who gave birth during her prom after hiding her pregnancy from everyone in her life, and how she discarded her baby in a trash can in the bathroom, literally throwing herself and the baby away. For once, Nickelback's sort of dreary post-grunge fits the atmosphere of the song, and it's a welcome change of pace lyrically opposed to the more unwelcome change on a track like Figured You Out. Overall, I do like this album a little bit more than Silver Side Up, and the best tracks are some of their best tracks ever. But the worst tracks definitely hit a bit of a new low for the band. The best tracks on this album for me are Flat on the Floor, Feeling Way Too Damn Good, Because of You, Another Hole in the Head, and See You at the Show. Comes the next contestant. Nickelback makes me want to kill Nickelback. <laughs> so now we got to talk about all the right reasons. The Long Road was a solid Nickelback album overall, but definitely the gap between the best and worst tracks was pretty big. All the Right Reasons has a bigger budget and some of Nickelback's best songwriting and most iconic songs, but the weakest tracks are something else. Nickelback's formula for their track list is starting to get a bit more obvious. The first two tracks are, you know, 
heavy post-grunge bangers. The third track is a radio single, and the second to last track is like an up-tempo power pop tune, and the closer is a down-home country-influenced track. The first two tracks definitely go hard. Follow You Home is a great introduction to their new and most consistent drummer, Daniel Adair. His drumming is phenomenal and is a high point of every Nickelback album he's been on. The song is a bit creepy lyrically, but the tune at the core of it and the riffs on it are top notch. And Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top adds some slide guitar and additional vocals to the track, and it's a really good pairing. His contributions to this album and the Queens of the Stone Age album that came out the same year are really incredible. And this song is a bit long for Nickelback, but honestly, I feel like this song could have gone on a little longer. Fight for All the Wrong Reasons comes right after, and it's kind of halfway between How You Remind Me and their other metal influence tracks. And musically, I like it. The riffs are excellent. The double time section with distorted vocals is great. The use of a few odd time signatures is interesting. There's a bridge where you get engulfed by a choir of chads. It's also a really nice touch. Though lyrically, it's a bit much. When Nickelback wrote lyrics about, you know, darker subject matter on past albums, it always felt more personal and carefully worded. There are a few tracks that kind of follow in the footsteps of Figured You Out, where, I mean, the instrumental does kind of go hard, but the lyrics are pretty gross. The first two songs on the album go even harder than Figured You Out, and I do enjoy them more than Figured You Out, but the lyrics are kind of written in the same pants around your feet headspace. Most of Nickelback's album titles are pretty interchangeable. Something like All the Right Reasons may mean something to the band, but the meaning is completely lost on me. This song is called Fight for All the Wrong Reasons, which is a tad confusing lyrically in that respect, because based on the lyrics of the song, they're definitely fighting for legitimate reasons because you're not compatible with someone you're in a relationship with. And the next song is Photograph. I don't really know if there's anything I could possibly add to the photograph discourse. I mean, lyrically, it's hilarious. Joey's head is Nickelback's equivalent to when Eminem says mom's spaghetti on Lose Yourself. It's a throwaway lyric that happens so early in the song that it just becomes a huge meme. And for better or for worse, that adds some mimetic value to the song. And it's another third track, which means it's the radio single. Musically, it sounds huge. And I kind of like the use of the chords that are non-diatonic to E-flat major in it. Oh god, I hate music theory. Chad's voice sounds a bit weird because it sounds like he either has flanger, phaser, or autotune on it, or potentially all three of those. I mean, at least it's memorable. If you ignore the lyrics, it's a perfectly acceptable radio rock track. And then track four is musically another solid butt rock banger, but my god, the lyrics about having sex in a car and getting caught in the act by your girlfriend's dad are a bit much. Lyrically, it's kind of like the bridge from Panama by Van Halen extended for an entire song. Yeah, it's a bit yucky. The next two tracks create kind of a lull on the album. While Saving Me and Far Away are like decent ballads on their own, the production is really wonderful on both of them. Like two sappy ballads on a Nickelback album back to back is not really my thing. Saving Me is like the how you remind me of the album. Like it's a solid song and the best ballad on the album, yet it's definitely a moment of deja vu. And Far Away is gorgeous production wise. The reverb around the guitars in the chorus is incredible. It is a bit too slow and sleepy for my tastes, even as someone who listens to a lot of like dream pop. But then the next two tracks display the gap in quality between the worst and best this album has to offer and it gives me insane whiplash. Next contestant is the weakest track. Lyrically, it's hilariously bad. It's about people hitting on your girlfriend at the bar and you beating the crap out of them after seeing them ogling your girlfriend. I do appreciate the sentiment, like if anyone was, you know, doing that to my future partner, like, yeah. But the way the, the lyrics are delivered, it all sounds like a big joke. 
I don't care how many bars of 11.8 you throw in there. I'm not that easy. I try to think of all of these types of songs from Nickelback as like being written from the perspective of a guy who thinks that a woman at a bar is his girlfriend, but it actually isn't his girlfriend and she wants nothing to do with him. And he's just like going through all these like power fantasies about like, man, if you touched my girlfriend, you don't want to know what I'd do to you, bro. But I mean, after that song, we have Side of a Bullet, which... The more I listen to, I think is the best Nickelback song since The State that they've written. The lyrics are also about a more serious and emotional topic. It's about the murder of Dimebag Daryl from Pantera, a friend of the band. Chad sounds furious, and you can really feel the emotion in his voice. The production is a little dirtier, and honestly, that's a welcome change of pace. And the riffs on the song are great, and they work in a Dimebag Daryl solo in the bridge. I feel the emotion and the passion behind the song, and I can tell that the band really tried to make a great hard rock slash heavy metal track with this one, and it definitely worked. Then we get to If Everyone Cared, which is basically feeling way too damn good if Bono ghost wrote the lyrics. The second to last track, Someone That You're With, is another solid penultimate power pop track. I love alliteration. And even with the more stalkerish lyrics, it sounds great. It kind of reminds me of Weezer a little bit. I know, like, I had to bring up Weezer in the Nickelback video too, but this is like a good Weezer song. And yes, the closing track, we got to talk about Rockstar. I mentioned the closing track on The Long Road, See You at the Show, being like kind of the precursor to Rockstar. Rockstar is like See You at the Show, but just even more glorious. And it's just a twangy party track. I like that they bookend the album with two Billy Gibbons features. Like, it's a song that I like more than I'd ever want to admit. Billy Gibbons' ad-libs on it just add to the experience. And the video is, it's a good time. Lupe Fiasco and Kid Rock are in it. And Ted Nugent. Getting all those people to sing a Nickelback song is priceless. So overall, this album is about as good as The Long Road, and the production is a little bit better, and all of the hangups I have with that album carry over to this album as well. The lyrics on some of these songs have definitely gotten worse than they were on The Long Road, but even the weakest tracks on here have flashes of brilliance from time to time. My favorite tracks on this album are Follow You Home, Fight For All The Wrong Reasons, Save It Me, Side of a bullet, someone that you're with, and rock star. Here comes the next contestant. You got me Nickelback? So after all the right reasons, Nickelback came back in 2008 with Dark Horse. All the Right Reasons had pretty sizable gaps between the worst and best tracks in terms of quality. Dark Horse takes that gap and goatsies it beyond belief. So since All the Right Reasons, the first two tracks on Nickelback albums will always be bangers. The third track is the radio single. That's also going to carry over throughout the rest of their career. My God, does this album open just as sleazy as possible. The opening track of this album is something in your mouth. And it's considered by many Nickelback fans to be one of their worst songs. But for some reason, I kind of love it. The main riff kind of reminds me of something off Bleach by Nirvana. Basically, a Nirvana song of Kurt Cobain was like the most chauvinistic piece of crap imaginable. So this song is a strip club anthem and the riffs, the energy, and the insanely catchy pre-chorus and the pummeling production courtesy of Mutt Lang is insanely hard hitting. I could see this song playing at a strip club and absolutely setting the place on fire. And then the second track, Burn It to the Ground, continues just this extremely dumb, but heavy, fun, and anthemic sound. And the added haze during the chorus are a nice touch and add to just the arena-sized sound of the song. Like the last album, there's some sequencing issues. Gotta be somebody and I'd come for you being back-to-back. -back. 
definitely creates a bit of stagnation. Gotta be somebody is fine. My judgment of the song has basically been clouded by my babysitter having adult alternative stations on all the time in the car, but it's, you know, it's perfectly acceptable. I'd Come For You is like a D-tier nickel ballad. Having these two mild cuts back to back is it's just not it. Fortunately, Next Go Round follows these two tracks and is much faster and just wakes you up immediately. Lyrically, it's, it's pretty disgusting. I don't want to hear Chad or anybody sing about covering someone with jello in a tub. And it kind of serves as a sequel to the track Animals from the last album. The insane riffs, fast drumming, and the guitar solo, and also the distortion on Chad's voice that renders him nearly unintelligible make the lyrics kind of easy to ignore. And then the best song on this album follows, Just to Get High. It's kind of a dark and like borderline gothic atmosphere around this track. The tune throughout the song is like super memorable too, but the lyrics are just, you know, harrowing and devastating. And they're about Chad's friend basically being completely destroyed by drug addiction to the point where he robs a woman at knife point. He eventually succumbs to his addiction in an alley. Chad had basically tried to help him to no avail. And Chad sounds furious and just angry at him for throwing his life away. And while you could argue that Chad's songs about people in dire situations can lack some nuance and don't empathize enough with the victims, these feel like his real emotions about these people and his grieving process set to music. And the metaphors for circling drains and the connection between smoking and the lyrics about burning everything you have make this song feel effortful and impactful. And it calls back to the emotional lyrics of their first few albums. But yet again, we got two duds back to back. The next song is Never Gonna Be Alone, which is quite possibly their worst ballad. It's agonizing. While I think people kind of oversell the whole like Chad sings like he's constipated talking point, it's definitely true here. Like he's yelping and howling well outside of his range. I mean, this kind of singing was more excusable on Curb, but with the increase in budget, this sounds like absolute gunk. Never Gonna Be Alone, one of their worst songs, is followed by another one of their worst songs, Shaken Hands which is about a prostitute that makes six figures working three days a week, which is probably impossible. The stadium haze, while they worked on Burn It to the Ground, on this just dorky, you know, slower rock beat, they just do not work. No one's dancing to this. That said, the Shake Your Money Maker chorus is definitely another unfortunate earworm to add to Nickelback's terrarium of unfortunate earworms. Then we have S.E.X., which is about Margaret Thatcher invading the Falklands. The lyrics are a bit creepy to say the least. The way they discuss consent on this song is very cringe. And for a band who's written about S.A. and the devastating effects it has on people, it almost sounds kind of hypocritical. They don't sound like they're joking when they sing this either, even though they they probably are. Unfortunately, the instrumental is kind of good, and unlike Shaken Hands, the tempo and the pace is all there, and the riff and the guitar solo in the nickel bridge, it's all incredible, but it cannot save a song this lyrically horrible. If Today Was Your Last Day isn't like as much of an up-tempo power pop track as the penultimate tracks, on the last two Nickelback albums. It's kind of like if everyone cared, but a little bit better conceptually. And it's just about, you know, living for today and cherishing every moment you have while you're still alive. And the lyrics segue pretty nicely into This Afternoon, a bit of a country-ish down-home closer. While other Nickelback songs that close albums are like, you know, a little bit more about you know, the good times and all that. This afternoon is just sort of a party track. It's about partying today. And there's a bit of a reggae influence on this countryish song. It's a bit silly, but I do overall enjoy it. The background chatter playing throughout this song is a bit much. Like, I know it's a party song, but keep your friends out of the studio unless they're doing gang vocals. This song could have actually benefited from some gang vocals. Overall, this is their most inconsistent album to date, on par with Silver Side Up, if not a little weaker. 
I wouldn't be surprised if this was the album that was really the beginning of the end for them popularity wise. It did very well, but I think the backlash started to take a toll on their album sales. While a lot of the backlash was undeserved, I don't think this album was strong enough to fight any of the backlash. My favorite tracks on this album are Something in Your Mouth, Burn It to the Ground, Gotta Be Somebody, Next Go Round, Just to Get High, and If Today Was Your Last Day. Here comes the next contestant! Nickelback featuring Nickelback. It's 2011. Nickelback are still a pretty big punching bag. Music critics definitely do not like them, but this album is a definite step up from Dark Horse, and the opening run of this album is very strong. This Means War is another barn burner of an opener. Chad's voice actually sounds a little bit more controlled here in a good way. The riffs are insane, the solo and the bridge. That nickel bridge is insane. Every bridge and outro that they put on these heavier tracks feels like they're just teasing me like they could write an entire album like the bridge on this song and it would be phenomenal bottoms up is kind of like the burn it to the ground of this album it's a riffy song about drinking and going crazy this song while pretty heavy and driving actually gives me some bro country vibes there's a good amount of nickelback songs that you can definitely see being pioneering bro country tracks it's another really dumb song that kind of slaps and the weird synth arpeggio on the bridge is an interesting touch but i do like it and when we stand together is the third track on this album meaning it's like you know the radio friendly single and it's actually not too bad kind of reminds me of sunday bloody sunday by u2 there's something also a bit folky about the song it almost sounds like they were listening to some of monsters and men or mumford and sons they want to mix that with more of like a loud rock vibe and the reggae drum fills leading in and out of the choruses. Nice touch. I like the drum beat carries on, like the drum solo in the bridge. That's also cool. The next two songs are bangers, but man, the lyrics have definitely gone down a few rungs. Midnight Queen is like halfway between grunge and the hair metal that got killed by grunge. The song slaps so hard. The bridge, the solo, and even the riff that plays throughout the song is crazy good. Yeah, this sounds like a Steel Panther song that isn't trying to be funny at all. The lyrics are pretty ridiculous, but they're not ridiculous enough to be funny. And then Gotta Get Me Some, another sleazy, sleazy banger. There are lyrics about a woman looking like a Baywatch rerun. H how does a person look like an episode of a show? It's like another Steel Panther song, but like if it was a collaboration with Maroon 5. And then Lullaby is kind of a welcome change of pace after getting two strip club bangers in a row. The instrumental's a bit too royalty free for my liking. The songwriting is pretty solid. Chorus is catchy enough, but the whole idea of Chad singing a lullaby is pretty hilarious conceptually. Kiss It Goodbye is actually pretty solid musically. While the effect on Chad's voice is a bit odd and some of the lyrics are a bit too on the nose, the driving dance rock groove is solid and Chad sounds absolutely feral at points. And yeah, some of his screaming actually kind of reminds me of like Jester Beddington from Linkin Park, like something he would do on a song. It's actually pretty cool. Try Not To Love You is a bit corny. It's another like far away or if today was your last day type of ballad. The production on here is very good and the driving drum beat and the guitar textures are very solid. And Holding On To Heaven is probably the best ballad on this album and one of the best ballads they've ever made. There are some cool chord changes. The chorus is definitely a masterclass in pop songwriting. This sounds like Chad absorbed every songwriting trick employed by Max Martin when Max Martin was writing for like the Backstreet Boys. The lyrics are definitely a bit corny, but you know, the song is so catchy that I don't really care. And then we have Everything I Want to Do, which is great musically. It, like the swung rhythm, synth arpeggios, and my God, Mike Kruger on bass. Killing it on this song. The bass sounds great. Bridge has a double time part with a crazy solo and some fast drum fills. But then 
the lyrics. You and me sitting in a tree, F-U-C-K-I-N-G. No, no, that's disgusting. It prevents this song from being one of my favorites on the album. And then the closing track is Don't Ever Let It End, which is just kind of a mid-nickel ballad. And it talks about, you know, the good old days. But it's not really like a sleazy country song. It sounds like a Frey B-side. So overall, this album is pretty solid and is a step up from Dark Horse. But there are some weaker tracks. My favorite songs on this album are This Means War, Bottoms Up, when we stand together, Midnight Queen and Gotta Get Me Some, I, I have to put on there. Kiss It Goodbye and Holding On To Heaven are also worth your time. Here comes the next contestant. After like the solid yet somewhat inconsistent here and now, mainstream rock was definitely moving in a different direction. And Nickelback was still one of the biggest modern rock bands, but... There were some new bands that kind of started to eclipse them in popularity, like Imagine Dragons. While Nickelback sounds like Nickelback for the majority of this album, there are definitely a few tracks where Nickelback is definitely imagining some dragons. Even the heaviest songs like Million Miles an Hour, Edge of a Revolution, or Get Em Up, they're a lot more danceable. Chad's always been a student of the pop charts. Million Miles an Hour is another opening Nickelback banger. The riffs, the grooves, and the guitar solo are all good, but the vocoder sounds a bit questionable. It's not a horrible idea. Like, Chad has probably had auto-tune on his voice somewhere, but... Uh, it doesn't sound very good, does it? Lyrics about, you know, doing drugs combined with the vocoder. It does sound like some bizarro novelty track. Edge of a Revolution is a hard rock song, and it's about Occupy Wall Street. Even if the lyrics are a bit corny and on the nose, they're really not wrong with anything they're saying. The American government hasn't really addressed too many of the issues Nickelback brought up here. The US government should definitely listen to Nickelback at least a bit more. After Edge of a Revolution, this album kind of completely falls apart. Then we have songs like What Are You Waiting For, The Hammer's Coming Down, Miss You, and Sister Sin. And I don't like any of them. They also use kind of this like movie trailer sound palette that I really don't like. And they also have like some chain smokers to your EDM parts. You have the intro to Satellite, which sounds like a damn ringtone. There are a lot of duds on this album. Though there are two songs that definitely stick out for interesting reasons. She Keeps Me Up and Got Me Running Around. And the former is a song that kind of sounds like Maroon 5. The lyrics are as sleazy as ever. And the references to Coca-Cola and, you know, doing it on the counter. It's a bit cringe, but the call and response vocals on the chorus, everything about this song is actually really catchy. Definitely their funkiest song to date. I don't know, no matter how hard I try, I can't hate it. I also don't hate Got Me Running Around. The Latin brass and percussion and the funky guitars. It sounds like one of the songs that Chad would have made with Carlos Santana. And the chorus and pre-chorus have also been stuck in my head while writing this video. There's a guest on this song and it's Flowrider. His verse is pretty standard Flowrider material. Probably more memorable than any of Flowrider's verses on his actual songs. What's that lyric about my girl only eats McDonald's? That is so relatable, Flowrider. I love you. This may be the first time where all the dumbest songs on the album are by far the best. Million Miles an Hour, Edge of a Revolution, She Keeps Me Up, and Got Me Running Round are all tacky as hell. Yet they are absolutely highlights, but... The best song on the album is Get Em Up. It's about two extremely incompetent hooligans who try to rob a bank only to find out that the bank is closed and then they get arrested. Coupled with the sleazy blues rock guitars, it actually kind of rips. Here and Now definitely has some of Nickelback's strongest ballads and popier tunes, but No Fixed Address 
has by far their worst ballads. And just like Imagine Dragons' most infamous material, the production is horrible horrible on these. The production on some of Nickelback's weakest albums can be good enough to redeem them from like being the absolute worst thing you've ever heard, but the Brickwalled production makes a good chunk of this album a chore to listen to. The closing track, Sister Sin, is quite possibly one of the worst sounding songs I've ever heard. The lyrics have potential. They're about being in a relationship with a girl with serious substance abuse issues, I think, but my god, the production is so Brickwalled and awful. I can't listen to it without feeling some form of ear fatigue. The ballads on Nickelback albums really do need some help production-wise or else they can be mind-blowingly bad. And the abysmal ballads on this album make this album by far their worst for me. Though on this trash heap of an album, I would recommend Million Miles an Hour, Edge of a Revolution, She Keeps Me Up, Get Em Up, and Got Me Running Round. You know there's a problem when the Flo Rida song is one of the best ones. Here comes the next contestant! Any Metallica fans in the house? Next up, we have Feed the Machine. Yeah, no fixed address, horrible album. And most Nickelback fans seem to agree that it's their weakest. And it was also their least heavy album by far. But then, from the opening minute of the intro track, they are bringing Nickel back. Opener. Feed the Machine, which was the first taste we got of this record, is an absolute rager. Like, coupled with the dystopian lyrics and the glitchy edits, it's better than anything Muse has written in this style in the 2010s. Coin for the Ferryman follows right after. It's another heavy track, and it's kind of like the burn it to the ground of the album. And it's about, you know, doing drugs and going crazy. And I love the way that Chad says the word ferryman. He says it like... Ferryman. And it's like the most Canadian he's ever sounded since he sort of like kind of said sorry on how you remind me. Shout out Canada. The third tracks are usually the radio single. What's a radio? And Song on Fire is a perfectly acceptable nickel ballad. It's not really remarkable, but you know, it, it'll do. But then we have the only truly bad song on the album, Must Be Nice. It's kind of like a post grunge like dance rock fusion that's kind of tacky musically and even tackier lyrically. It's all these nursery rhymes with kind of an edgy twist to them, a la corns, shoots, and ladders. There's been an avalanche of horrible TikTok songs that just kind of make nursery rhymes all like edgy and cool. It wasn't even great when Korn did it, and like a lot of things with Korn, everyone who tried what they tried completely failed. And it ties into like a chorus about someone's detachment from reality and all that. And it's just... Ugh. Following this track is After the Rain. And it's another acceptable ballad. Tis not a banger, but... It's definitely a step up from Must Be Nice. And then the second half of this record is their strongest sequence of tracks since the state. For the River has like a serious funk metal groove and an insane guitar solo from Nuno Betancourt of the band Extreme. The lyrics on this track are also about a prison break. Maybe this is the sequel to Get Em Up. And the tense vocal rhythms and the grooves are just like really lending well to like the lyrical themes of like a prison break. Home is, you know, a solid ballad on the album that is about the repercussions of growing up in a broken home, the inability to escape from intergenerational toxicity. These aren't really topics that I've heard discussed on a Nickelback album since, like, Silver Side Up. It sounds like they put a lot of effort into the lyrics here, and I always really appreciate when they do that. And then we have The Betrayal Act 3, which is a 6-4 metal banger. The drumming is phenomenal. The acoustic guitar intro sounds like the intro to like a classic Metallica song from the 80s. Chad's feral vocals work amazingly well and are top notch throughout the song. You just betrayed us! And then Silent Majority is another penultimate power pop track. Lyrically, it's kind of similar to Edge of a Revolution about like rising up and being part of the silent majority. Every Time We're Together is the closer. You know, it's cute. And it's shares a lot of the same feel-good energy of closing tracks from Nickelback's pre-No Fixed Address era. And let's not forget about the real closing track, The Betrayal Act 1, which comes after The Betrayal Act 3. As far as I know, there is no Betrayal Act 2, but 
Betrayal Act 1 is interesting because it sounds like it came from like medieval times when in their past lives they were commissioned to write music for a church or something. It's a solid closer. While this album isn't the heaviest and it doesn't really follow the lyrical themes of like a dystopian society that the opener kind of hinted towards, it's their best batch of tracks since the state. The only song that's bad lyrically is Must Be Nice. And even then, that song is nowhere near my bottom 10 for Nickelback songs. My favorite songs on this album are Feed the Machine, Coin for the Ferryman, For the River, The Betrayal Act 3, and Silent Majority. Here comes the next contestant! What would you be doing back in those days? Throughout the pandemic, and the years following 2017, seems like Nickelback laid pretty low. And then, towards the end of last year, we got the teaser to the song San Quentin. And with that, the announcement of a new album, Get Rollin', which dropped this past November. I wrote the script for this video. I had to change my plans at least a little bit around this album. Fair is fair. The album title here actually does make some sense. Rolling as in driving or operating a motor vehicle. Hopefully not under the influence. And another is, you know, rolling up like a blunt or something. I, I don't think it's a nod to Limp Biscuit, but I, I wish it was. So San Quentin is another classic barn burner of an opener. The opening riff is a bit mean because it sounds great. It sounds a little metalcore inspired, but uh, I, I mean, it just basically turns into a standard Nickelback opener. It's still solid. You know, it's about being up to no good and going crazy. And it is one of their catchiest songs. It is some dumb fun that you love to see from the boys. And then the second track is Skinny Little Missy, which is another barn burner, another one-two punch. I remember people when they saw that this was the name of the second track were horrified. The lyrics are much less cringy than the title implies. I mean, yeah, it's obviously a sex song about, you know, like a bad girl, but it actually went over fairly well. I mean, there's a great solo, and a great bridge, and the chorus, while it does give me some deja vu to She Keeps Me Up, I think it is definitely a high point on the album. Those Days is the third track, which is, you know, the radio single. And it has a great chorus, but the verses are abysmal. The verses almost sound like a Wiz Khalifa guest verse on like a really generic top 40 song. Some of the ad libs on this track, like the Ace of Spades by Motorhead ad lib and Got So High Sweet Child of Mine. And it is a song about, you know, the good old days and kind of looking at this photograph, so to speak, but it's a bit much. Then you have High Time. This is a dirtbag anthem if I've ever heard one. And the lyrics are about getting high. The song definitely kind of sounds like an Uncle Cracker or Kid Rock type of track, but one of their better tracks. Nickelback has always been pretty good with writing, you know, countryish tracks, and this is no exception. You have the lyric get rolling in the chorus, driving across the country, and also, you know, rolling up some dro. Vegas Bomb. It's kind of a callback to the whole Dark Horse here and now era. And it's a funky, like, swung metal track. The lyrics are just more like, let's go crazy. Let's have a ton of alcohol and do drugs and maybe go to the strip club and all that. It has, like, this weird pre-chorus that, you know, has, like, these marching snares and chanted vocals. <laughs> and the way it, like, glides from the verse to the chorus is a lot. The solo is phenomenal and there's a part in the chorus where it's like the gonna unwind part. That's been stuck in my head for quite a bit. There is a minor problem with the rest of the album. For some reason, right at track six, the rest of the album doesn't really have any heavier tracks. On albums like Feed the Machine or Here and Now, there was usually a good ratio of heavy tracks to ballads. The second half of the album just kind of gets to be a little bit too mellow for my tastes. The track following Vegas Bomb, Tidal Wave, did make my ears perk up quite a bit. Like, it kind of sounds like a Tears for Fears Nickelback mashup that I'd make. There's definitely an 80s energy on this song, and it kind of ties back into, you know, the 
remember in the 80s vibes of those days. The dancey drums and ethereal guitars and the lyrics about loving you like a tidal wave. There's something very dreamy about it. It's not really something that I've ever heard Nickelback do before this track. It is an experiment that went over pretty well. Does heaven even know you're missing? It's basically a generic nickel ballad with corny lyrics. It's not unlistenable. They've written worse ballads. But then you have one of their best ballads ever. My favorite song on the album, Steel Still Rusts. And it's about, you know, being in the military, the effects that it has on your psyche after coming home. And it kind of opens like a porcupine tree song. The Mellotron and the acoustic guitar. There's kind of a Southern rock, littered, skittered energy mixed with like some modern prog tropes. And the guitars in the post chorus, they sound incredible. But then we get Horizon, which basically just sounds like another mid Christian rock ballad. Unfortunately, the chorus is catchy beyond belief. Who gave it the right to be that catchy? The way the last chorus just comes in out of nowhere, that was kind of a nice touch. And then we got another penultimate power pop track returning, Standing in the Dark, which picks up some momentum from the last few tracks, but this doesn't rock much harder than like the All American Rejects. It's catchy enough and the songwriting's there and the bum 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 da 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 da. The hits going into the chorus, you know, they're cool. And then we have Just One More, which is kind of an epic closer. I haven't really heard them close an album like this. There are some synth arpeggios. It also does sound kind of 80s at certain points. There's kind of like a Bon Jovi type of energy about this song. It, it's not bad. It goes over fairly well. So overall, this album is a bit of a grower. Like the pacing is a bit awkward. And I do wish that there were some more bangers in the second half of the album. But some of their best ballads and mid-tempo cuts are on here. And their lyrics are nowhere near as tacky as they were on past albums. And even the songs with sleazier subject matter, the lyrics aren't that bad. For a Nickelback album, that's actually a lot. The production on this album is definitely a step up from their last two albums. The subtle reverb on the drums has gone a long way. My favorite tracks on the album are San Quentin, Skinny Little Missy, High Time, Vegas Ball, Tidal Wave, and Steel Still Rusts. Over the course of the past few months listening to Nickelback, I've learned way more than I thought I would. The thing that I already knew was that Nickelback are nowhere near as bad as people were saying they were. The world has kind of moved on to hating on Kid Rock and Imagine Dragons and Maroon 5 for good reason. And now that people are more nostalgic for the 2000s, Nickelback definitely brings back some good memories. I remember my sister getting in trouble with my parents for listening to Rockstar because it had a few swears in it. Like Nickelback was a part of our childhoods. All this time, I feel like I've taken like this songwriting course. I've learned more from this experience than any college course in songwriting could ever provide me. Chad Kruger has always been a student of the pop and rock charts. He was able to nail Kurt Cobain's songwriting formula on Curb, and he's been able to nail like Max Martin style pop too. I feel like I got better as a songwriter listening to all of these Nickelback songs. Throughout their discography, you can kind of travel through the history of popular rock and pop over the past like 20 or 25 years. The more I listened to them, the more I started to see similarities between them and another band that I think unjustly got a lot of hate in the 2000s, and that is Coldplay. Chris Martin is another phenomenal student of trends in pop music and rock music and pitchfork indie stuff. And while Coldplay makes music that I gravitate to a bit more overall, I definitely see a lot of similarities between Nickelback and Coldplay's songwriting approaches and why people generally like to make fun of them. They make some serious earworms. Their drum sound on albums like Here and Now, Dark Horse, and All the Right Reasons is phenomenal. And as a drummer, hearing that snare for the first time is a mind-blowing experience. So even when listening to every album by a band as infamous as Nickelback, I felt like I got a lot out of this experience. Overall, 10 out of 10, would nickel again. This has been William Marantzi. Thank you.